Broadcasting live from Honolulu, Hawaii. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's newest show, Top of the Line. I'm your host, Ben Lau. Aloha, and thank you for tuning in. I open our show with a quote used by author Robert Greene in the opening of his book entitled Mastery. Quote, everyone holds his fortune in his own hands. Like a sculptor, he will fashion his own figure. The skill to mold the material into what we want must be learned and attentively cultivated, end quote. Our guest today is someone who has molded his life and pursuits with great skill, tremendous inspiration and perspiration, and in his own fashion with nonstop cultivation. And he's achieved mastery across a gamut of endeavors. Our guest is my friend, former teammate and college swim team captain, Wilfred Steven Utengsu, fondly known as Fred. And to those of us he got naked with, Freddie. Fred has accomplished many things across many areas. Business tycoon, CEO, chairman of the board, team builder, team leader, team owner, chairman of the league, philanthropist, mentor. He's an architect and master sculptor of self and of others, individually and as teams. Born in Cebu City, Philippines, Fred resides in Manila with his wife and partner in life of 40 years, Carrie. He is one of three children of Wilfred Utengsu Sr. and Bonnie Mary Brooks. But he is, in fact, and indeed, a devoted and beloved member of two families, the Utengsu clan and the University of Southern California. Fred began his career as an age group swimmer, developing into a national and international level fish from the Philippines before relocating to the US for school. He choose, chose USC to one, study, and two, to swim, not necessarily in that order. Fred wished to swim under legendary coach Peter Dalen and train with some of the best swimmers in the world. A born leader and cheerleader and someone everyone looked up to, Fred was elected our team captain. After graduating, Fred returned to the Philippines to help his dad run a family business, Alaska Milk Corporation. Succeeding his dad, Fred grew the business, took it public, and molded it into a leading food conglomerate. Not one to waste time resting on his laurels, Fred started other businesses and devoted himself to training for triathlons. He's competed in over 50 of them, and he's since achieved world-class status as an elite member of Ironman. Always a team leader and cheerleader, Fred built teams of great employees and great athletes and led them to successes. As a professional sports team owner, he built a Philippines basketball dynasty, the Alaska Aces, a 14-time national championship team. Win after win, Fred has earned recognition as a widely admired business executive, team owner, athlete, leader, and as a major contributor to his country. Fame and acclaim in seemingly every aspect and walk and swim of life, Fred returned to Los Angeles. Reports are that he took a plane rather than swim, bike, and run the distance on his own. And he dropped in on his other second extended family at USC. One of the best universities in the world, one some parents will risk breaking the law and jail time to try and send their kids to. I don't mean to make light, but rather to shine a bright light upon Fred's character by contrast. Fred and Carrie, both SC alums, have other family who attended. Their eldest daughter, Ashton, is also a USC alum. Always one for doing things his own way, the right way, Fred's approach was, of course, unique. Rather than law breaking or making a big donation to help with Ashton's admission, they allowed her to get in on her own merits. Then they waited till she graduated before making a record setting donation, the largest ever by a former student athlete. And they helped build USC a new complex, the Utengsu Aquatics Center at USC. We'll be seeing a lot of this beautiful complex in the 2028 Summer Olympics in LA, be playing a starring role as part of the swimming venue. Now, let's see Fred. Aloha, Fred. A big thank hey, you ben. for joining me today. Thanks, Ben. Good to see you, and thank you for the very kind and generous introduction. Fred, it's you're simply a marvel. To know you, your story, it's it's awe-inspiring. Maybe also a bit tiring, watching you in action, listening to me attempt to summarize it. How are you? Good. Good to be here, and I'm actually here in the islands in Kona, Hawaii. So uh, 
just uh, just across the channel. Cool. Well, on screen right now, we're showing a picture of how you looked around the front time we first met. I was 16 on a college campus tour. I took this picture of you, same beautiful girl on your arms today, your sweetheart, Carrie. You two haven't changed. You haven't changed. I called you up about my new show, this show, and your first words to me were, how can I help Ben? You've always been about promoting and helping others achieve. In our team photo book, the team voted you, the USC team spirit leader, Dr. All. You remember that? I do. It was very, very special. And uh, I was flattered to have the opportunity to, to lead the USC men's swimming team as a spirit leader and, and as team captain. But uh, tremendous privilege. Looking at this amazing complex you helped build, Fred, it's, it says it all. It's all a dedication and commemoration of other athletes swimmers, divers, water polo players, coaches, you and your family have built a shrine. You've also erected a beautiful backdrop and training facility for future Trojan swimmers and student body at large. Here's my question. You're all about lifting up others. Where does that come from? What motivated and inspired you to do this? How did you get your start? What was your first big break? Well, I, I think my first break was uh, going to USC and being allowed to join the swim team because I was not a heavily recruited swimmer coming from the Philippines. And uh, Coach Dalen said, look, um, you can walk on. Uh, if you do the workouts, we'll let you have a spot on the team. And I actually broke my leg my senior year in high school and I got to campus with my leg in a fiberglass cast. So not wanting to risk my place on the team, I actually swam with, with a cast on my leg and a pool boy for the first three months, just to be sure that I would not get, get kicked off the team. And, you know, I look at that and Coach Dalen said, you know, if you're willing to put in the work, we'll have you on the team. And that meant heaps to me because I think in life, when I see a work ethic, when I see that dedication, I take a second look at that, that person. And in swimming at a sport, it's a team event. And so having that opportunity, I wanted the chance to celebrate this with generations of Trojans to come, to have this opportunity to train in a world-class facility, to have access to world-class coaches. And let's face it, we individually are only as good as some of our parts. And not, I'm talking our individual parts, I'm talking about those that surround us. So I wanna celebrate the great Trojans who've come before us and those who follow and those who will follow for generations to come. There's a lot to come. I'm, I'm, I'm bummed we have such limited time. Um, news of this show has been trending on social media a little bit, not in a viral sort of way, but at least you know, as relates to me. We have some questions in advance from some of our audience members who are on today. One question from Michael Stricker of New York is, you talked about this a little bit, but what skills did you learn as a student athlete that translated to your professional success? Well, whether, whether you're a swimmer or a football player or a basketball player, I think every student athlete first has to put their academics first. And so if you're training 20, 25, 30 hours a week, and then you have a full course load on top of that, to me, first of all, is work ethic. You know, if you just going to school alone and trying to do well in your classes is hard. You add 30 hours of training and competing on top of that, that molded me. And it's something I learned from my father who exhibited an amazing uh, work ethic. Then on top of that, you have the components of dedication, teamwork, camaraderie. These all served me very well in life when I immediately graduated from college, uh, working at, at a bank. And then when I came back to join the family business, I took those values and those characteristics and used them the way I formed our leadership teams. And that is something that I look for today. And I try and inculcate with uh, the people I interact, whether I'm advising them or mentoring them. Uh, it's something I wouldn't trade for the world. It was a tremendous opportunity. Chinese American Filipino, you have a multi-ethnic background. And with your wife, Carrie, your family has a large number of the world's ethnicities covered. What culture or cultures most resonate with you? Well, my father's Filipino Chinese, my mother's American. My wife is American, but was raised in Mexico City. So we do touch many parts of the, of the continent. And I think, you know, I look at ourselves as, as global citizens. I resonate with all of them and I'm comfortable 
in many different parts of the world. Obviously, the Philippines has been my home for the majority of my life. But whether I'm in Los Angeles or in here in Hawaii um, or down in Mexico, I'm, I'm comfortable wherever we are. And I, I guess home is where my wife is, you know, in, in a cheesy sense of the word. But I'm really comfortable in, in any culture. And I think being multicultural myself makes me more understanding of the place I'm in. It may be different than what I'm used to but it's not supposed to be the same. And I think that's what we have to learn about when we visit other places, when we have to be culturally and racially tolerant. COVID-19, how's the pandemic impacted your life? You mentioned you know, where you live and, and whatnot. Interesting question, Ben. I, I came to Los Angeles, my wife and I did February 29th of uh, last year thinking we were coming to the States for two weeks to actually watch a James Taylor concert. And uh, the lockdown happened in, in the US and Philippines as well. And so we couldn't travel. And the, case has been, the cases have been very bad in the Philippines. It's been very difficult dealing with the pandemic there and, and still is today. So for us, you know, we've been in the US uh, since February 29th of last year and probably unlikely to return home until after, after the new year. So that's been the difficult part. I've been able to manage business, everything from this side, while still trying to help uh, our, our people in the Philippines as much as possible, whether it's on the PPE in the early stages of the pandemic, or now trying to find sources for vaccines because the country is less than 20% vaccinated. But the silver lining in all this is our children are all in the United States. They're actually all in California. And it gave us a chance to spend a lot of time with our, our children and our grandchildren. And we had two grandchildren born during the pandemic. So uh, I, I'm really blessed that we had this opportunity and the time to spend it with them. And you know what, we're alive. Um, you've shared, you've lost a lot of people. I, I know of many who've lost a lot of people. You're about to celebrate another birthday very soon. So happy birthday, just days in advance. Thank you. Um, Living in California with your family, you must have to go outside from time to time. Um, what's that been like? What have you, is, is life different uh, from how you know it in the Philippines? I mean, it's truly a terrible, dire situation over there, but parts of California where, where your kids are have had a rough time of it at times as well. Well, you know, it's, I look at that question in two parts is, is one, how has it been living in, in California or Hawaii? during the pandemic versus the, the extreme lockdowns in the Philippines. And of course, you know, we've been fortunate to have more freedom uh, in, in the US where, you know, regardless of the state, uh, even with mask mandates and, and all of that. So that, that has been a, a good situation for, for us personally. And it's been very difficult for colleagues and friends and family that are still in the Philippines. But to me, the biggest epiphany that I have observed during the pandemic is it's been 40 years, close to 40 years since I, I lived in the, in the US for any extended period of time. At the beginning of the pandemic, I saw what I thought was a kinder, gentler, more understanding people. And it's probably the way people were concerned for one another during the early stages of the pandemic. Unfortunately, my observation, whether it's an anthropological study, is that as this has worn on, and maybe people have been fatigued by the situation, is that I, I feel people have become less tolerant and understanding. And whether it's a politicized situation, whether it's anti-vaxxers or anti-mask mandate or, or the like, it's to me bothersome because it's not the way I think society should behave that we can agree to disagree and we should do it professionally. We should do it with um, humility. And I don't see that. And I, you know, I turn on the news, whichever channel you watch, and there's a lot of talking over one another. And that concerns me because I don't think that's an example for our youth. That's not the way we settle our differences. It's been an you know, eye opener for me. And, and I do hope that leaders, whether they're heads of state, business leaders, professors of ethics, you know, we find different ways to teach our youth on how to handle our differences. The youth are important. It doesn't end there. It begins there for certain. 
Um, I don't know how we get the message to the uh, ones who are a little bit taller and bigger than that. You should know a little bit better. We need leaders across the board. You are one. I want to ask you when you're running for president of your country, <laughs> I hope you do, uh, or even of our country, I think you're qualified, but we, we need all the goodwill um, and well-oriented people uh, to be in those positions of leadership that we can get. You've earned a reputation as willpower personified, and more than a handful of the press have referred to you as a man of iron will, and even a real life Tony Stark. Do you have some big secret identity or alter ego? Are, are you really gonna run for president one day? No, Ben, I, I am not cut out for, for politics at all. I mean, the, the joke I say is that I speak my mind because it hurts too much to bite my tongue, and I, perhaps don't exhibit all the diplomacy that's necessary to be a, a politician. But the iron will, I, I think, comes from observing my father as a young boy and seeing how hard he worked and knowing his story about having lost everything during World War II and then having to rebuild from scratch. And that I began to understand more as a young adult and then when I started to, to work with him. And the other part is, as you know, Ben, we were, we were division one collegiate swimmers and that takes a lot of work. And so that, that willpower started there in the pool, looking at that black line six days a week, you know, 50 weeks a year, year after year. And it's what allowed me to persevere in, in Ironman, because as you know, you're, you know, you're in the ocean for a 2.4 mile swim, you're biking 112 miles and you're running a full marathon after that. And people say, is it physically challenging? And I said, it is physically challenging, but I've always felt the toughest part of Ironman is the mental part. And your mind will quit before your body quits in most cases. So it's just, I think we, many people have the, the fortitude, the mental fortitude to do it. It's the training, you know, it's a swim training, it's the work training, the professional training that's allowed us to do that. And people who have participated in the sport who didn't think they had it in them, after a period of time, they develop that willpower. That's not something I think you're necessarily born with. I believe there's a component of that, but I also think it's something that's learned, as is leadership. Do you uh, think in terms of, um, well, Leadership, we could go on on that a lot. I want to touch on the Iron Man uh, contest. Another question from one of the audience members, Aisha Holcomb of uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. She wants to know how you do it, how you keep your body fit. 50 triathlons, multiple Iron Man competitions. How do you do it? How do you, how do you still do it? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm retired from Iron Man competition. It was, I had 17 years doing it. It was wonderful. Uh, it's also about cross training because you, you have to pace yourself, especially as we, we get older. Uh, my last time at Ironman World Championships, I was 50. And so you train differently when you're 50 than you do when you're 30 or 35 years old. So it's about pacing yourself, giving yourself a lot of time to recover and, and rest up before you go and hammer the next, the next workout. And it's also about, you know, managing the, the loads of, of training. I had a great coach in Lance Watson who coached uh, Olympic gold medalist and world champions. And so he kind of gave me the type of training that my body could accommodate while still pushing myself. And you, there are times where you also have to say, look, this is, this is a rest day. But the reality is it's really, it is hard on the body. I had several surgeries from overuse and and work on the shoulders and, and feet. And so I've, I've gone back into the pool, Ben, I'm back in master swimming where it's a little bit, uh, I would say easier on the body, but it's still hard and it doesn't get any easier as we age. Back into swimming. Um, you still doing Ironman or, I mean, you're credited with bringing Ironman and a whole host of other triathlons and other sports to Southeast Asia, as well as building that championship professional basketball team. Why? Well, first with, with Ironman, I, I got involved in doing shorter distance triathlons. And then I did uh, my first Ironman abroad. I, I went down and I, I raced in Australia. I did Honu several times here on the big island. 
but I really wanted the chance for Filipinos to have that experience. It really is magical, Ben. I mean, it, I know it sounds hard and it is hard, but the experience and the journey your body and your mind go through, training first and then racing one of these events is really special. And so I wanted to bring Ironman to the Philippines, which we did back in 2009. We started with about four or 500 athletes. And now the database of Ironman in the Philippines is over 20,000 people. And several, you know, several hundred go abroad to race around the world. So it's to me about sharing that experience with, with other people, giving them the opportunity to challenge themselves in a way that they probably had never thought of before. Um, I just recently sold the franchise back to Iron Man as they were getting ready to take their company private again. But it was a, a fantastic opportunity to work with uh, the Iron Man organization, and I still stay on as a, an ambassador for them. I, I didn't I didn't realize those behind the scenes mechanics of Iron Man that you had to buy something or own something. But well, it was just it. it was the only way to really make it happen. I just uh, we needed to be in control and and understand the, you know, the way of, of doing things in the Philippines. But it was, it, was, it was a great experience and still feel very close to the organization. In, you know, knowing you and how you set goals for yourself and for others, it, it may look like you've achieved all your goals, but for example, you chose USC. I mean, John Neighbor, the Furness brothers, the Bottom brothers, our own teammates, you know, Olympic golds, Jeff Float, Chris Kavanaugh, the other Olympians, you know, Roni, Bear, you know, Fitzpatrick, Frischnick, not to mention our many uh, five rings, women of Troy. Um, I imagine you once dreamt those dreams, Olympic gold, maybe had such goals. And have you achieved all your goals? Well, I, I didn't get to go to the Olympics. So that to me is, is one of the regrets in, in life. But, um, you know, I had the opportunity, but my father felt it was important I start working. And uh, he said, if you want to go off and train for the Olympics, you're, you're on your own. And so I, I got my first job in banking during the uh, 1984 Olympics. Looking back on that, if I had really forced myself, I could have gone, I could have picked up a job flipping burgers somewhere and live in an apartment with four or five other people and, and do it. So that, that's really on me at the, at the end of the day. But um, it's something I wish I'd had the, the opportunity. But in terms of success, Ben, uh, I, I really think success is a continuing journey. When you feel that you've accomplished everything in life, it's probably time to meet your maker. Uh, and, and success doesn't necessarily come in, in the boardroom or in the pocketbook. I, I think it's a state of mind. You know, I, I look at now, where, where do I derive my greatest pleasure? A little bit in philanthropy. Uh, a little bit about working with uh, young adults, whether these are these are students that are getting ready to go into college or getting ready to graduate from college, or our early stage entrepreneurs getting ready to get their business ready for their first Series A or taking their company public. I think I'm at a stage in my life personally where it's really enjoyable to watch other people do their stuff and try and teach them some of the things I learned, you know. If I can impart some of that knowledge and wisdom to them earlier than, than later, it'll serve them better. And it's very rewarding to see other people be successful. You know, you're known for saying this. Uh, we are measured by what we accomplish, but we are defined by what we attempt. Tell me more, please. Well, when I say you know, people are measured by what they accomplish, so we, we remember the, the gold medalists, right? We might remember the silver and bronze medalist or who won the U.S. Open, but we don't remember the hundreds and the thousands of other athletes who were just trying to get to the starting line. And that's why we are measured, uh, we are defined by what we attempt. You know, we are attempting to do these things. And that's where I look at willpower and fortitude you know, the, the will to do. And, and I don't think those people are celebrated. We, media only covers the winners, but they don't cover, take an Ironman. All right, you know who the world champion is, but what's really special in Ironman is that they also celebrate the last person to cross the finish line. 
before it turns midnight, in which case the, the race is officially over. That to me is a very important celebration, a celebration of effort, of willpower, of fortitude. And I, you know, I just have had that quote in my mind because I don't think we recognize the people who are trying. We always recognize just the winners. It's a great point. It's a really very important point. That has something to do with the, your iron kids and all the other stuff you do for the teens in the Philippines and elsewhere? Well, you know, iron kids basically came from the children of Ironman athletes who were watching mom and dad going out there and doing it said, hey, I want to be like mom and dad. You know, they do a very short distance race, but it's also for us about creating healthy lifestyles for the youth. You know, you look at today's youth and they're on, they're on their phones, they're on their PlayStation, they're on some kind of electronic device and they're not out there running, biking or swimming. And they've lost the pension for going out and having a great time perspiring. And I, I really think if we're not careful that we're going to see the health of our youth be compromised if they're not active at the early stages. You know, they're going to, you're going to see heart disease starting in their 40s and 30s, not the 50s and 60s, because they have not been active as, as young people. You remind me of our former governor of California in fitness, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. On, on the subject of kids, I don't remember reading or learning about uh, Ashton or Sean or Kayla taking up Ironman or becoming national level swimmers. Listen, they were all great athletes in their own sports. All, all our children participated in, in high school sports um, and they were very good. They didn't go on to compete at the, at the D1 level, although our youngest daughter did represent the Philippines at the uh, World Touch Rugby championships about five years ago. So it, it, to me, again, that's about being defined by what they attempt. They went out there, they're good athletes, they're still active today. You know, they live active, healthy lifestyles. But, um, you know, being a, being a committed swimmer or being a committed Ironman is something that you have to want from within. You, a parent can't push it or a loved one can't push that. It's what drives you from inside. Fred, I wish we had more time. There's so much uh, I want to explore and share with uh, our audience members, but uh, we're running out of time. Um, I have to wrap this up. Um, the title of our episode would be way too long if we were to do credit to you and your multitude of careers. You know, accomplished talent that you are with all the many accolades, builder and leader of amazing winning teams builder and provider of a headquarters for future team members, living a cinematic picture-perfect existence, always surrounded by beautiful women, in this case, your wife and daughters, a man of style, and one who can wear a suit and deliver a speech. As I said at the groundbreaking ceremony, people are measured by what they accomplish, but they are defined by what they attempt. Today, we see what we have attempted, but we should be proud of what we have accomplished. Thank you and fight on. Viewers, please stay tuned for this. This is where we won some credits of our own, but, but please wait for it. I trust you do receive this for yourselves too now after spending a little bit of time with Fred. And I'm, I'm sorry I took so much of it up trying to summarize your amazing career. Fred, thank you. Mahalo for joining me today, Mr. Iron Man, Mr. Tony Stark. And viewers. Ben, great, great catching up with you too, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Viewers, from my home to yours, from me and my family to you and yours, mahalo and aloha. Best. See you, Fred. <laughs>